So <clears throat> my talk is about breaking the sound barrier of genomic data. Breaking a barrier is, first of all, breaking a code. And we are today in a situation where Champollion was two centuries ago when he was breaking the hieroglyphic code. He was working actually on the Rosetta Stone, who actually translated a Greek text into a demotic and a hieroglyphic language. And this kind of inferences is exactly what geneticists and scientists are working on. They are converting genomic information into proteomics and metabolomics. So <clears throat> this is a toy problem. We are trying you know, to correlate strings of letters and identify some patterns. This is the understanding of a new grammar. We're using biomolecular bi um, tools to, to cut the text in different pieces and see if we can rebuild it. And eventually, this can make sound. This sense is basically the, the core structure of this proto-language. It's about semantics. It's not only about syntax and grammar. And this proto-language is now being found as the core structure of all the natural languages we are commonly using every day. So basically, the hypothesis that you will read between the lines of my speech today is that there's a permanent correlation between nature and nurture. And what we use to think or attribute to culture, such as language, will probably one day be attributed to nurture, to nature, which is genomics. It's a bold assumption that needs to be demonstrated. This is an hypothesis. But we have more and more evidence showing that this core structure, this proto-language, could be actually um, <clears throat> a very uh, powerful and influential um, substratum that is uh, predisposing to uh, our cultural, educational capacities. <clears throat> so I wanted to also give you a flavor of the scientific pace we are currently witnessing. This is a set of 23 chromosomes. And the NIH in the US back to 2005, identified one genetic mutation, a variant, involved in a disorder called age-related macular degeneration, causing blindness. The year after, scientists at the NIH found other mutations correlated to other disorders, cardiac disorders, bowel disease, Crohn's disease, the year after, type 2 diabetes, second quarter in 2007, third quarter, fourth quarter, 2008, second quarter. I don't have enough space to show you what happened back current, during those seven previous years. But you understand my point. My point is that there is a huge scalability in terms of data sets. And the higher the levels of complexity you can uh, find in living organs or, or living forms, cells, but also large organs themselves or organisms, the higher the level of, com of complexity and that data. So if you want to really capture the meaning of these data and the magnitude of what you can do with this, you really also need to understand the level of error you can find associated to each of those um, analyses. And today, we are ba basically tinkering. We are not really on a stable ground. <clears throat> to understand this complexity, 
We also need to bear in mind things that most of you already know, this interaction between nature and nurture. Nature is the text. This is just like, you know, this wonderful statue, the Michelangelo's David. <clears throat> and you have the same statue when you're after a diet in the US. So basically, it's exactly the same text, but the environment, the diet, has reshaped the statue itself. And this is the context. So you have the genotype on the one hand and the expression of the genotype that is, well, reframed, reshaped, revamped by the environment. It could be diet, but it can also be pollution, drug side effects, whatever, radiations. So <clears throat> this pervasive, permanent interaction is what makes Genomic analysis are complex. And today, the new quest of geneticists is the ENCODE library, which basically is at the frontier of those reshapements uh, uh, that you know, create those interactions between the text and the context. If there's a typo in the text, the text becomes inept. And then the context, which is the, the, geno the phenotype, becomes unfit. So there is a connection between the inept and the unfit. So that's also very interesting because in the midst of this, you find cures. And if you can identify those, typo, those type, typos, and if you can you know, um, have a target in interaction to fix this typo, then you can suddenly imagine to tackle the cause of the disorders, not only the symptoms. So we are also entering into an etiologic era of medicine, not only the semiologic history that we've been uh, looking at over the past centuries. We were just curing symptoms. We were not addressing the causes of the disorders. And now we are now having the tools and getting more knowledgeable about how we can make those targeted inter interventions. So this is the sound barrier. We are stockpiling a massive flow of biospecimens, genomes. Those signatures are barcoded to make sure that we can create huge cohorts that we can analyze in a statistical robust way. By next year, basically uh, almost 100% of cancer patients will be fully genotyped in Germany in some uh, cancer centers such as the Krebs Center. We are now also understanding the economy behind this. Resequencing is cheaper than stockpiling your genome. Resequencing is cheaper than stockpiling. So the archiving industry will probably no longer exist. And actually, because your genome is constantly reshaped by methylation caused to radiation, caused by radiations, you need to follow the evolution of your genome and re-genotype it on a permanent way. Now, <clears throat> it's also the next generation gap. The cost of sequencing is plummeting, but the cost of interpreting the data is increasing dramatically because expertise is rare. Most of you already know <clears throat> this curve, you know the Moore's Law, for a given price. The storage capacity uh, of a digital chip doubles every 18 months. Now, for the genome, for a given price, the storage capacity of a DNA chip, a microarray, doubles every five months. And that's why you see this inflection point here it's going much faster than the digital industry that we've been looking at over the past decades. So <clears throat> there's a data deluge. This is fundamental science. But just few months or few years after those discoveries, you see the emergence of 
an industry. And they are, those discoveries industrialized and at, at an exponential pace. When you see this literature, and if you're sitting at the intersection of science and business, you understand that those who own the data will own your health. Because basically, the, the health industry is based on the data industry. Giving a cure to a patient is basically giving the right cure to the right patient is basically being data knowledgeable. It's a data driven industry. A drug has a value based on the clinical data that prove its risk benefit ratio. So this industry is data driven. And for that, we need new tools, new algorithms. Well, you have, of course, a champion, Google, but you also have different approaches, non-Euclidean approaches that help you to uh, <clears throat> work with continuous and discrete variables and also tolerate missing data. And that's important because we don't have comprehensive sets of data. From an epistemological standpoint, the analysis remains the same in terms of data analysis. You have, you have the four stages of data analysis. What is going on? How is it working? What's going to happen? How can I make a difference? So the problems remain the same. It's just the, the magnitudes and the tools that we're using were completely different. <clears throat> Making a difference, the convergence of those transformational technologies will make a difference. And this is an unprecedented time that we are witnessing today. So many technologies, so many breakthroughs interconnected with each other. Without the breakthroughs themselves, nothing would happen. We need also entrepreneurs, brilliant entrepreneurs. And I'm sure that there are many of you in this room who probably know Jonathan Radberg, the guy you know who pioneered the Ion Turin technology, who was acquired by LifeTech and Thermo. So this is the next generation sequencing technology. This guy used an existing technology and readapted the semiconductor technology to reorient it and accelerate the genomic sequencing capabilities. That's fascinating because if you want you know, to get a leverage, a huge leap in terms of accelerating this industrialization, you need to find existing technologies, not to reinvent the wheel from scratch. That's very important. And that's why this technology was <clears throat> extremely successful. Another brilliant scientist entrepreneur, Nick Goldman, bioinformatician, that is probably going to sell tomorrow data storage, archiving. He will probably archive our videos, books, pictures, not on tapes, not on discs, not on DVDs, not on paper, but on DNA, which is basically the most primeval substratum meant to stockpile massive flow of information over centuries. For that, he has digitalized books, music, videos into a genomic code and reconverted this code into music, videos, books without any typo. An Eppendorf tube could stockpile one million DVDs, Blu-ray DVDs, one million Eppendorf tube. For that, you just need darkness and cold to maintain stability of this DNA. And we all have at home darkness and cold. It's called a fridge to prevent methylation. So that's also fascinating in terms of data when we're talking about big data. Of course, Craig Venter, not only the, this pioneer who invented the shotgun method and revolutionized the way we are now dealing with the genome sequencing, but his capacity to synthesize a minimum genome 
of a bacteria cell. And from this bacteria cadaver, he basically synthesized a genome and reboot the cell who started to divide again. He has signed several partnerships with Exxon Mobile to produce biofuels and with Novartis to produce also uh, synthetic vaccines. This is a revolution. This is a revolution, but Venture is not ending his race now. Oh, no. Re Venture is now working on a new project called Human Longevity. Not only to work on the genome and create the largest centralized bank of full genomes, but also to correlate those genomic data with our microbiome. The microbiome is a way to see how our body, how our health is in close interactions with the living organisms that we carry every day. So this is probably a fascinating field. And for that, you need a core platform and infrastructure that he is setting up in San Diego. He is also working on reprogrammation, cell reprogrammation, to you know, reach this point where you will probably live 100 years, but you will feel like 60. This is his goal. He is also, of course, uh, <clears throat> followed with chaps that you already know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who founded Calico, who is now uh, um, <clears throat> directed by Art Levinson, the, the founder and CEO of uh, Genentech. And Calico is also embracing this huge, massive flow of data. I'm ge I guess maybe this morning you have uh, had some references regarding this optical lens that is uh, capturing uh, or monitoring your glycemia rate for diabetic patients, so you can <coughs> monitor your glycemia and connect this lens to uh, make sure that uh, <clears throat> diabetic patient will have a, a permanent follow-up with their doctors. This is a gadget. This is a gadget because, again, we are monitoring symptoms. This is not the future. The future is how we can reprogram cells, pancreatic beta cells, to make sure that the patient's pancreas will produce insulin and not inject his or herself with insulin. If you can produce insulin on your own, if your cells are healed, what's the point of developing those connected tools? And this is what this guy is doing. Shinya Yamanaka, Nobel Prize of Medicine 2012. Probably one of the most important Nobel Prizes in medicine ever. Shinya Yamanaka understand how to reprogram a cell by carrying four genes in a um, <clears throat> deactivated virus. The virus contaminates a fibroblast, a skin cell, integrates the four variants, and the cells start to regenerate and come back in time to an undifferentiated state, which is a quasi-embryonic state, then this cell can be replaced in a cardiac environment, a bone, a pancreatic environment, a pulmonary environment, a neural environment, and produce neural cell, cardiac cell, pancreatic cells. Yamanaka is understanding now the basics of how to reverse the process of aging. How to reverse the process of aging how to rejuvenate, to regenerate our organs. That's fascinating. And that's also correlated to genomic engineering. Our linear brain cannot really grasp the exponential transformation that we are looking at. At the beginning, you know, all those dots here in the early growth in this curve almost always remain imperceptible. We consider them as you know, zero. But the explosion of meager to massive is shocking. 
And we are now, at this point, we are now starting to really see this emergence of converging technologies. And we are now ending up this blind spot that we used to have until now. Still, healthcare systems remain archaic. Why is that? Too much paper. Let me give you some symptoms of this obsolescence. Drug side effects. The fourth cause of death in the US last year. 12 million patients in the US misdiagnosed. The British Medical Journal reported a study analyzing over 1,000 medical files. 60% showed illegible handwriting. 41% omission of important diagnosis. 32% didn't list the name of the drugs that were prescribed to the patient. And 30% of, of those files could not be found when needed. 30% paper. <clears throat> we need to rethink this problem. We cannot use the same patterns of thinking that we used to have in the 20th century. We need to adopt electronic health records. And genomic technologies are going to accelerate the adoption of those electronic medical records. Why? Because those technologies and the, the level of information we can get from those data is so important, it will become very rapidly the cornerstone of a medical diagnosis, a medical intervention. It's the way we can target treatments. How can we circumvent this? No way. So we need this technology. And this technology, by chance, is becoming affordable. Affordable, essential, cornerstone. Well, let's place genomic data at the center of those electronic medical records. And because there is no other way to stockpile the genomic data than to dematerialize the data, then we will have dematerialized electronic medical records. And then all the additional procedures, image, imaging, RMI, and so forth, will suddenly be also dematerialized and combined to this aggregate, which is basically genomic. So affordable genotyping and DNA pre-dematerialized data requiring electronic storage. That's why it's almost evident that in the short term, the acceleration of genomic data will facilitate the adoption of electronic medical record. And some major players in the US are, of course, leading the way. Take another example. Hurricane Katrina destroyed one million medical charts. And actually, thousands of survivors left with chronic conditions and no medical data. HIV, diabetes, how can you help those, those patients if their records are destroyed? So paper is gone. We can no longer, we can no longer work with paper when it, when it comes with health issues. So what do we need exactly? We need to turn on the light. First, we need an integrated healthcare wallet. We need an own version of Fedwire. You know, Fedwire in the US is the primary network of international payment. Ooh, sensitive data, money. If we can do it with money, why can't we do it with health data? And this is what Obama has implemented with the High Tech Act in 2009. The Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Many of you are familiar with this. There are carrots, there are sticks. If you don't use those electronic medical records in your daily practice as doctors, as hospitals, then you can be penalized and the penalty will come by 2017. So actually, short window of time to adopt 
those HIT. And Medicare Medicaid are also using this to improve the value-based purchasing programs. <coughs> Monitor fraud, also increase the quality of care, integrate performance metrics reporting, outsource research. So basically, those data and those tools contribute to increase transparency. And the point is also to diffuse the risk, the tensions, the negative perception of those social breaks related to uh, privacy. Everybody, of course, is, is uh, <coughs> concerned with privacy when it comes with health data. And when you genotype your cells, remember that you can, you can discover things that you ignore. You can discover things that you would have preferred to ignore. And you can discover things that you, pre you would probably prefer that other would ignore. So those three levels create important hurdles to the adoption of those electronic medical records. But encryption and aggregation is an easy way to create this anonymous flow of data. Health records, promises, perils, pitfalls. There are many, many steps before we can really find a secure system. Also, in terms of pitfalls, the silos. Hospitals are organized in silos. The IT systems are extremely fragmented. The social breaks are also enormous. How can we overcome this? The case of the Assurance Maladie in France is fascinating. Some civil servants at the Ministry of Health are whispering and confessing that if the Assurance Maladie opens is its databases, then many research, researchers and statisticians will probably correlate the data and understand that years back, the minister or the government had made huge mistakes in terms of health choices, reimbursement choices, because they could have anticipated by crunching the data that this would have been the other, uh, the solution would have been somewhere else. To protect or to preserve their <coughs> position, some, some prefer, you know, to also remain or keep people in this opaque situation. And this opacity is, of course, not for the sake of, of uh, the health system itself. So opening up those data is absolutely essential for health system. What we need also is value-based payment applied to hospitals. For that, we need access to real-life data. And it's common sense in many other countries. Not in France. I strongly advise you to look at the IHM initiative, the, health, the International Consortium of Health Outcomes Measurement. It's an initiative run by <coughs> the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, the BCG, and Harvard Business School. The point is to value hospital performance by creating new sets of uh, <coughs> indicators that matter to patients indicators that matter to patients. When you have prostate cancer, what matters to you is to make sure that you will not have a re-hospitalization a few months after your intervention. What matters to patients to make sure that you, are, you will not be incontinent or impotent after the intervention. That's what matters to patients. But today we are not looking at those standards. We are just blindly reimbursing every single procedure based on quantity, not on quality. This is what we need, and the data revolution is also going to revamp this. We also need new tools to assist doctors in their diagnostics capacities. Because again, health problems are essentially data issues. And the Watson developed by IBM is tackling this at the root it's basically reading the literature, integrating clinical cases, correlating this with prescriptions and real-life practice. Do you want to get diagnosed by a physician that does not 
uses Watson. <clears throat> Pablo Picasso used to say that computers are useless because they only give you answers. They only give answers, but they also address interesting questions and interesting correlations. Look at the FDA. On the FDA website, you see the correlation between drugs and markers, biomarkers. And most of them are genetic markers. It's not like trivial. Many people used to say that maybe within 10 years, 20 years, this will happen. You know this precision medicine, these targeted therapies. No, you already have hundreds of cases that are reported by the FDA. And drugs that were abandoned a couple of years ago because the risk-benefit ratio was not evaluated properly for a given segment of the population could be reintroduced in the system because if you target the right segment in the population, the risk-benefit ratio will, be, will suddenly become positive. So we will probably see the rebirth of abandoned drugs. We will also see the development, the rapid development of <clears throat> timely genomic sequencing at the patient bed. And this is just a portable uh, genomic sequencing device. So the device industry is going also to be dramatically revamped. To conclude, to conclude, nearly one third of the people in this room will declare a cancer. Sorry, guys. But <clears throat> 146 mutations account for nearly 95% of all major disorders and birth defects. More than half of us are carrying one of these mutations now. To make this knowledge actionable, we need two things. We need first robust science, brilliant scientists, to connect genomic tests and environmental context. First need. But the second need is valorous entrepreneurs. Why valorous entrepreneurs? We have forgotten this, you know, this old qualification, valorous. But actually, this is exactly what defines an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone, is a creative thinker that is creating value, value, valorous. He's alone. We need to help those guys. And you are, most of you in this room, probably valorous entrepreneurs. So the key point here is how to, to spot, to ignite this fire and make it happen. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the world. Pessimism is only for the ill-informed. Thank you. <clears throat>